All right. Um, welcome, everybody. We're going to get started here in just a few minutes. So just bear with us. We want to give everyone an opportunity to join. So we'll get started here in about a minute or two. All right, we're at about two after. Um, I want to welcome you to the final edition of the Ohio Safety Processes and Funding Course webinar. Uh, again, my name is Paula Hyman, filling in for Victoria Beal from the Ohio LTAP Center. I saw some of you went ahead um, from the previous um, sessions and remembered where that questions pod is. We're going to use that again today. Um, for those who are new joining, just go ahead and type a quick hi, hello, hey. Um, down in the questions pod. We're going to respond to questions periodically uh, from within that box. Today's presentation is available for download in the handout, set, handout section. And like previous sessions, if you're unable to download them for any reason, put your email address into the questions box and I'm going to email it out to you. We are recording these sessions, so they will be made available to you um, at a later date. I just want to thank you in advance for your participation again. And I'll pass things off to Jeremy Thompson. Jeremy? Or, or Ray, are you going first? <laughs> okay, I'll go first. Go first, so, Ray. Hello, Ray Brush here. Okay. Hello, everybody. I'm Ray Brushhart with the Ohio LTAP Center. I'm called a safety circuit writer. And uh, today is our part four of our uh, webinar. Go ahead, Jeremy. Jeremy's in charge of flipping the slides. <laughs> okay, so we've made it to part four. So congratulations, everybody, for sticking it out with us. So part four, we're here to talk about pedestrian safety improvements for the PSIP uh, projects. So we'll be taking a look at um, ways that we can improve pedestrian safety uh, at the local level. Um, we've got a couple of projects today from the city of Coshocton and the city of North College Hill to share with you. And uh, we're talking about uh, a program from the Federal Highway Administration called STEP, which stands for Safe Transportation for Every Pedestrian. And so you'll see plenty of uh, pedestrian safety countermeasures that will help us reduce the number and severity of uh, pedestrian and bicycle crashes in Ohio. And so, uh, go ahead, Jeremy, the next slide. All right. Um, so, just... um, at this, I was going to introduce you. Go for it, Ray. <laughs> so, I'm going to turn it over to Jeremy Thompson. He's been with us through all the other parts as well. And uh, he's with the Highway Safety Program and um, they're in charge of the HSIP program, the LSAP program. And so uh, without further ado, I present Jerry Thompson. <laughs> Thanks, Ray. Right. Um, as we have with the other three sessions before this, just wanted to do a quick overview of the uh, Highway Safety Improvement Program uh, requirements that we have. It's a federally required program and its goal is to reduce traffic deaths and serious injuries on all public roadways in, in Ohio, uh, for ours specifically. Um, you'll see the phrase towards zero deaths used a lot in uh, our, our presentations or on our random flyers or uh, other things that we distribute um, that, that just goes along with this program. Our funding, um, it's $159 million annually. Uh, you may remember 
on the other uh, slides, it was 158 in the last three sessions, but uh, I was corrected this morning. It's, it's actually 159 million, uh, not, not a huge change, but uh, typically uh, for projects that don't involve or that aren't totally signed signals, pavement markings, and guardrail, we do require a 10% local match uh, when we fund projects. <clears throat> But through 2020, we have been funding everything at 100% due to some uh, additional toll revenue credit that we have saved up. So um, we expect that to keep going through at least this year and hope to continue that on into the future. Any public road with a minimum of 10 crashes over a three-year period is eligible for this funding. Um, the requirement can be waived for fatal and fatal crashes and severe injury crashes. Uh, if, if they make up a high proportion of those crashes, if there's less than 10 in a three year period, any activity consistent with our strategic highway safety plan that uh, is going to correct or improve a highway safety problem is eligible for project funding. Um, and education and enforcement are, are what we deem ineligible activities for direct funding, um, although they can be used uh, um, within a project uh, that, that is fixing infrastructure. Um, for, for example, and for the city of Columbus, we're funding some pedestrian improvements uh, on the east side on Cleveland Avenue. And along with that project, we are developing some um, guidance and uh, some how to use a pedestrian hybrid beacon flyers to distribute statewide. So that's, that's part of that education funding that's being tacked onto a project, but not directly funded by itself. Uh, our application cycle uh, happens, they're due every April 30th and September 30th every year and the, the months um, succeeding those, so May and October, uh, are, the committee will review projects and award funding. Um, smaller projects that only require an abbreviated application uh, can be sent in any time <clears throat> throughout the year. And uh, these projects are typically $500,000 or less uh, in con construction costs. And uh, to get any of these projects moving, uh, the, the district has to get involved and, and the district will be the ones uh, officially applying for these funds on behalf of the, the local agency. Applications are reviewed by a multidisciplinary committee um, that is made up by multiple districts and uh, a few offices out, out of central office. A typical safety project application is anywhere from that $500,000 mark to the $10 million mark. Um, although we rarely do see uh, projects that, that reach that $10 million mark, they, they do happen. Um, the, the average project is $1 to $5 million in, in that range. Um, so that we, we see a lot of roundabouts, uh, signal upgrades along corridors and, and uh, roadway with realignments, that stuff. That, that's usually pushing the, the million to $2 million mark. But large changes like interchange improvements or longer corridor improvements can, can reach that $10 million mark. Uh, we also fund systemic treatments. It can be argued that some of those corridor treatments are systemic treatments, and, and I would agree. Uh, some of these things are like upgrading signs on curves. We recently finished a statewide project for that, uh, adding additional chevrons and uh, uh, re, re analyzing our, our suggested speeds uh, leading up to curves, uh, installing backplates at intersections. We, we also recently had a project to do that around a lot of the state, uh, installing advanced detection at signals. We had a project sell a couple of years ago that uh, installed advanced detection at every signal that, that we own that lies on a national freight route, uh, so where we have a 10, 15 plus percent truck traffic. Um, then installing edge line rumble stripes, which, which is another one that we are currently pursuing. After today, um, hopefully you'll, you'll continue to be able to understand the HSIP application process and, um, our and specific to today, our emphasis on vulnerable user safety. Um, you'll be able to discuss what the pedestrian safety improvement program is and how aspects of, aspects of it could be applied to, to your own communities. Um, Appreciate some of the innovative and data-driven projects coming out of the safety program, which which I will go over uh, after the pedestrian safety improvement program, and um, just just after today, you'll you've seen a, a few different projects from of, of varying uh, sizes and 
uh, urban, rural context, systemic to spot treatment. So realize that a wide range of projects can be funded by this program. So I just want to kind of do a quick overview of uh, pedestrian safety, uh, the state of it in Ohio, and and uh, but I'll start off with showing a video of the state of uh, pedestrian safety nationally and FHWA's STEP program. So get that started up in a second. You got to click that button in the middle. All right, that work okay, Ray? It looked all right. There, some people had a few issues. I'm going to put the video link in the chat, and we will also send it out um, with the after action email. So for anyone who would like to view it again. Okay, awesome. And uh, the YouTube link is included in the slides that that were in the handouts. Um, sometimes uh, bandwidth, especially on our VPN, can be a, a little spotty. So. Um, thanks for sitting through that if, if you weren't able to see most of it. Oh, so we have our, um, so what are some of the treatments for pedestrian safety recommended by FHWA STEP program or STEP initiative? So in order to be able to vote, just hit the escape button if you were in full screen mode. And Jeremy, we're at about 68% uh, of votes in. Uh, majority, 91% here, um, chose option A, B, and C. Awesome. Yep, that, that's correct. Uh, those are three um, of, of their seven uh, major countermeasures that they recommend. Moving on. 
So why is pedestrian safety important in Ohio? Mm -hmm. um, One second, Jeremy. You need to oh. uh, go back up and share your uh, screen again, coming out All of right. the... Mm -hmm. Sorry. Good to roll. Looks good. All righty. Um, so why is pedestrian safety important in Ohio? It's an essential transportation option in Ohio commu communities. Uh, we, we do have a a number of communities in Ohio where vehicle ownership is, is fairly low uh, compared to nationwide statistics. Um, walking and walkability contributes to access to jobs, services, education, economic development, quality of life, and mobility. 2018 marked the worst year for pedestrian deaths in, in, the, count, in, in the country, I should say country, sorry, uh, since the 1990. Um, People walking are our most vulnerable roadway users and are more likely to be killed in a serious injury or seriously injured when involved in a crash. When roadways are safe for the most vulnerable user, they are safer for everyone. Most of uh, these pedestrian or, or even uh, countermeasures that uh, are, are mostly for bicyclists um, also increase the safety of, of our, our motoring public. So um, just the, the agenda for this early part, um, I, I'll, just, I'll go through some key trends that we've seen in Ohio, some some key resources that we've already covered funding, uh, and then I'll, I'll go through the pedestrian safety improvement program itself. So out of our pedestrian safety memo, um, which it can be found online, and uh, we, we can distribute that at some point, um, our overall trends for the last 10 years, we've had just over 1,100 pedestrian fatalities and just over 5,000 serious injuries uh, from pedestrian crashes. Crashes are mostly occurring in the most urbanized areas of, of the state. Um, probably not to anyone's surprise, uh, 10 of our 88 counties accounted for 63% of, of our severe pedestrian crashes. So about 11, 12% of, of our counties are accounting for 63% of these crashes. Um, pedestrian fatalities are happening and, and a large amount on arterial roadways, um, so usually wide, high, high volume uh, roadways, um, that they're overrepresented by, by a lot. They make up um, about seven, eight percent of our total uh, lane miles in the state, uh, but just over 50 percent of our uh, pedestrian fatalities and serious injuries. 33 percent of all fatality and serious injury pedestrian crashes have occurred and the highest need block groups. Um, so in the last, over the last couple of years, uh, ODOT recently um, worked to kind of develop a need and a demand score for all of our census tracts in the state, um, which, which I'll go over some of the criteria of that scoring later. But um, uh, from, from our highest need uh, uh, census tracts, uh, we, we got a third of all pedestrian crashes happening in them there, we're, but only 16% of our population li lives in those areas. Um, and then there's just a little graphic to showing what I just explained. Um, most pedestrian uh, fatal and serious injury crashes happen at mid-block crossings, um, what, whether marked or unmarked, um, uh, walking along the roadway either uh, with or against traffic is another big one, uh, at intersections through vehicles, and and that's not, these numbers aren't necessarily taking into account who's at fault here, um, whether that through vehicle was running a red light or whether uh, a pedestrian stepped out um, while that through vehicle had, had a uh, permissive movement for the, themselves. Um, some resources that we have, uh, we, we've kind of covered GCAT and CAM tools uh, through the last few webinars. Uh, TIMS is our uh, traffic information management, uh, some, some, something, sorry, I forget the, the S stands for. Um, and there's, there are different map viewers there and uh, you can just get a plethora of information from uh, the classification of the roadway to, to crashes, to um, uh, volumes on the road, to, to where we have ADA curb ramps. So there, there's a ton of information on TIMS. Um, our Active Transportation Academy is a, is a free resource. Um, uh, on, on the ODOT website to, to just learn more about uh, different ways you can uh, improve active transportation, whether that's with infrastructure, with education, um, even some uh, training for, for law enforcement on, on how to properly um, 
report act, uh, active transportation crashes because uh, we we found that pedestrian crashes are are the the information that are that's provided in a crash report for pedestrian and bicycle crashes is just not um, up to where uh, vehicular crash reports are. Uh, there's not as much information there for us to to review. Um, and then and then funding. Uh, we've gone through some funding options, but this uh, link to the program resource guide gives uh, funding options beyond the safety program itself, like transportation alternative funding or uh, CMAC funding, Safe Routes to School, which is kind of a mix of safety and uh, TAP funding. So I highly recommend checking that out if you're looking for additional funding sources. Um, I'm going to briefly cover our uh, GCAT, or GIS crash analysis tool, uh, which, which is within TIMS. Um, if, if you need a username, uh, you click there and just uh, ask for an account, and uh, some, somebody at ODOT will, will work with you to get you an account set up. Um, you can, uh, to, to get gather crash data, it'll first prompt you to enter in some information, like the years you're looking for, um, if you're looking for a specific crash type, uh, specific crash severity and location, whether that's by ODOT district, county, um, or township, city. Uh, then um, pop populate a map for you. Um, different different shapes and colors indicate different types of crashes or how severe the crashes were. Um, on, in in this uh, little information box. Uh, that it'll also give you an option to, to click on crashes or, or draw a shape around crashes to, to determine how you want to export your crash data. And then uh, the CAM tool, which is located um, where, where the slide's showing, uh, will be how you can enter in. It'll auto analyze all the crashes from GCAT. So you can upload a GCAT spreadsheet into the CAM tool, which is just a macro enabled Excel spreadsheet. And uh, it'll auto populate charts and graphs and, and show you um, what what your major crash types are, how severe your crashes are, and that kind of stuff. And the CAM tool, kind of what a, a blank one looks like. We, we've gone through a couple of full ones in the last couple of webinars already. Um, next, I want to go through the uh, active trans. Um, it's a, a good way uh, to, to just kind of highlight where your vulnerable user crashes are and where you might might have a uh, high demand or need for for a vulnerable user vulnerable user uh, um, facilities um, so you, you can pull up crashes on here that that will be specific to ped and bike crashes um, but but uh, my, my favorite tool to look at here um, when we're either reviewing projects or just looking for for projects to, to spot ourselves is, is the demand and need mapping um, through, through this active transportation layer again. Um, in, in the Walk Bike Ohio category, which Walk Bike Ohio is a, is a initiative um, out of our statewide planning research group um, where, where they, they did most of this analysis and, and got, got this map to where it is today. Um, you'll see here, this is our demand and need mapping and the darker Blue shade means there's more demand for for walking and biking. Lighter blue, uh, less demand. Whether whether that's because the, just there isn't as there isn't as high of a population there, or car ownership is higher. Um, and the the need categories in the pink, uh, light pink to dark pink, dark pink being uh, more need based off our criteria, which um, for to calculate demand, uh, we we. Uh, uh, Use use the categories on the left um, and compare them to a state statewide metric. Um, so, how did an employment density in this census tract compare to the statewide average? And then that's how we scored that. For need, we uh, compared percentages within a specific census tract and then like kind of bucketed them into groups to score them. So. So demand is is they're calculated slightly differently and have slightly different um, criteria, um, but it, they're they're very useful information to have and, and you can kind of see where some of the hotspots are uh, where where demand and need overlap and that's probably where we should be providing more pedestrian facilities if we don't currently have them. Um, and also coming soon uh, in Tim's we have our state and U.S. bike route system if you haven't heard of it um, so that is currently mapped in Tim's. 
but we recently ran, ran a level of traffic stress analysis, which that basically just determines how comfortable a route is for a, a cyclist. Um, one being very comfortable is usually a separated path, and five being not comfortable at all, it's a limited access facility, um, maybe a like high speed 55, 60 mile per hour, um, uh, four lane separated highway, something like that. Uh, so so that, that will be coming soon to, to the maps and we hope to apply that to more than just the state and US bike route system. All right, well, we'll head to another polling question. And after this polling question, I'll ask uh, for any questions that have been submitted thus far in the chat box. So what roadway classification has the highest rep representation of pedestrian fatalities in Ohio? All right, we're, back. we're at about 30% voted. We're gonna wait just a couple more seconds. All righty. All right. <clears throat> So we have 4% um, voted for collectors, 66% um, voted for arterials, and 30% voted for local roads. Uh, right, the correct answer there is arterials. Um, arterials make up about 55% of our pedestrian fatalities in the state. Do we have any questions from the chat box that have come up? Uh, we answered the one question. Um, it came in, someone was wondering, are we getting this data from police reporting or is it coming from the local government? And uh, Ray provided the response. It's a combination of law enforcement and ODOT. So we sent that out. No other right. questions. Yeah, I guess I can, I'll expand on that one. Um, that's the only question we've had. Um, but yeah, the, the OH1 reports are filled out by law enforcement when a crash happens. Um, and uh, the Department of Public Safety um, kind of reviews those, and, and there's a just a, a catalog of them. That that's where our, our GCAT tool or our GIS crash analysis tool is pulling data from. So it's it's those. It's in so in um, cohesion with the Department of Public Safety, we get that da data. Um, and I guess one thing I did want to mention is you may have noticed that. Uh, the most recent year of data that we've been using is 2018 for these slides. Um, that's that's large in part due to uh, crash data isn't always the cleanest when it's first entered in. And usually we have to take up through the first six or seven months of the year to, to clean up the previous year's crash data and make sure it's accurate in our systems. So we while 2019 data shows up in GCAT, we, we didn't necessarily endorse using that data up until a couple of weeks ago. So, so we haven't updated all of our, our graphs and figures yet to, to reflect that data. Um, but I, I ran some numbers for pedestrians and, and were similar trends. I think we were a few fatalities below uh, 2018's numbers. For, for pedestrian fatalities, but um, the overall trend over the last 20 years is, is still going up. So with that, uh, any questions from, from that little spiel, Paul or Ray? Nope, nothing in the box. All righty. Um, I'll move on to a specific project that, that uh, we, we funded through our abbreviated application process and also through our local safety assistance program where we did a, a road safety audit, which is kind of just a, a mini safety study. Um, so in North College Hill, uh, we analyzed that, that area in the orange box there. Um, and just from the early road safety audit, the, the crash analysis, um, that, that chart on the right, we saw rear ends, left turns, and side swipe crashes as uh, kind of our highest representation of crashes within uh, this area. Um, and then just some other interesting crash facts uh, below there. Um, just kind of the months they happened, or uh, most of them happened in the daylight, which, which is pretty pretty typical because that's where our uh, level of exposure is. More people are driving during the day. 
um, and most happen Tuesday through Thursday. Uh, so this this is just kind of a uh, kind of schematic plan sheet of of the recommendations that came out of that road safety audit. So um, on that road uh, going left to right or east to or east west um, on the bottom. Uh, you'll see we, we kind of systemically are, are placing crosswalks there. That's what the CW is, and uh, the the T is tree trimming. So so we're we're in increasing line of sight and sight triangles at these intersections and uh, adding some marked crosswalks there. Um, the SSs that uh, you can see down here as well. That's uh, some speed signs. So uh, those like LED signs that tell you what speed you're going. We're we're putting those there because they um, up here. We were putting a pedestrian refuge island, so with with the uh, painted yellow median there, we were able to fit in a, a properly sized travel lanes. Um, some more crosswalks up here. Then uh, uh, last last year, uh, after the road safety audit, and it was kind of preliminary to uh, the pedestrian safety improvement program, which I'm getting into next. But so this is a very, uh, I guess, small area of systemic pedestrian improvements um, that that according to FHWA and their step initiative, like th these types of improvements are, are where we should be put a little, little bigger than the one I just shared, the pedestrian safety for, for this program. So uh, as I've been saying, pedestrian fatalities have been going up. Uh, this is a snapshot of 2009 to 2018. Um, that's, that's a pretty high percentage. It's uh, from 2009 to 2018, that's, that's more than 50% increase. Um, so that's, Unlike any of our other crash trends, so in, in any specific crash type, so it's it's one that that we know we have to tackle. Um, so so that's that's why we have programs like this. Um, and back to that county by or graphic by county, um, ten ten counties did account for sixty three percent of our severe pedestrian crashes, and these are all the counties that include our most urban urbanized districts, our, our largest cities. So um, we knew that maybe targeting these first would, would be uh, the biggest bang for our buck to start. Um, I mean, not not saying that we don't want to uh, implement pedestrian countermeasures everywhere. We 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 want to, but this is one of the uh, this is just how we wanted to kind of pilot this specific program. Um, just to reiterate, arterial roads were the the deemed the the most dangerous for our vulnerable roadway users as they had an overrepresentation of fatal and serious injury crashes compared to their total, total statewide lane miles. Um, and four lane arterials were specifically uh, bad in that case. Um, and, and along these roadways, mid block crossings, again, were, were the, the most common, most frequent uh, crash type that, that we saw. Those typically happened along our uh, mid to high speed facilities, 35 miles per hour above, and, and most of these were, were in urban settings on city maintained roads. Uh, walking along the roadway, uh, this, this is a crash that uh, unlike other ones, this is more more frequent to happen uh, at night. Um, just it, it's tougher to see, especially if there's no street lighting out there, or no positive contrast street lighting. Uh, it usually happens where there's a lack of facilities, there's no sidewalks or shared use path present along the roadway. Um, and most of these happen all, along four lane arterial roads. Um, and then uh, through vehicles at intersections, I, again, mostly happened in urban contexts. Um, and this typically happened where we didn't have marked crossings at the intersection and, and it, the intersection typically wasn't signalized where these crashes were occurring. Any questions at this point? Okay, nope, there are no questions in the questions pod right now. All right, so the pedestrian safety improvement program itself um, purpose was to provide eligible high risk jurisdictions funding and assistance to implement proven low to medium cost pedestrian safety countermeasures along high risk facilities. Uh, the funding, uh, we, we allocated $10 million in construction funds. Um, and, and granted anywhere from 750,000 to two and a half million dollars per participant. Um, and and uh, that was kicked off in, uh, let's just say October, 2019. Sorry about that. Um, so so the, 
process has started um, and we're actually in design of, of projects for all the cities involved right now. Um, so repeat of this graphic. Uh, um, so um, how, how we figured out, so this unlike our um, application-based projects, uh, we, we did all the preliminary work ourselves internally and, and targeted the eight specific cities shown on here. Uh, these, these eight cities have the highest number of fatal and serious injury pedestrian crashes from 2009 to 2018. And for this pilot program, we, we wanted to, to make this more targeted rather than um, application-based. So we reached out to uh, stakeholders at all of these eight cities, and they all accepted uh, free, free money to uh, design and construct pedestrian improvements in a syst systemic fashion uh, around their city. Um, so we, we allocated funding um, partially just with a base allocation and partially based off of uh, a need, which the need was, was based off their total fatal and serious injury crashes uh, proportioned out compared to each other. Um, the program itself uh, followed this a, a fairly standard, but um, a kind of innovative process. So, so we, we planned to, to start as, as you would with any infrastructure project where we uh, Worked, worked with each city and we basically just gave them a spreadsheet um, that had a, a empty locations column and all the different countermeasures that they could use, which, which included um, most of the step countermeasures and, and basically said, pick your locations, pick, pick your countermeasures. We, we had um, estimates in for each countermeasure already. So as they filled out the spreadsheet, it automatically populated an estimate um, and once they hit their allotted amount that we that was a, a couple slides ago uh, that that was their list um, and and they gave it back to us and, the, and then we worked with the consultant to uh, start designing the project um, which is where we're at now um, we actually have our first submittal coming in on Monday for um, the I think all of our district four cities involved so Canton Akron and Youngstown will will be seeing um, our first set of plans for this this uh the, that group at least then and over the next couple of months we'll get the the rest of the plans in for the other um five cities and uh we we look to start construction for all eight cities between february and april of 2021 so i guess part of the innovativeness of, of this process was was kind of just streamlining everything um bundling up countermeasures together in a systemic fashion um and, and getting this project from from planning to construction in 18 months, which which is not not typical for a project of the scale. Um, so we're we're on track to do that right now. Uh, there's been a couple of hiccups along the way, as expected with any project, but we're we're still uh, gearing up to hit that 18 month mark for from planning to construction. So this this is just kind of that that process um, said. Or listed in, in words rather than a graphic, but um, some similar thing. So uh, as I mentioned, the location selection process, um, just submitted countermeasures had to conform to the criteria that, that we laid out in the spreadsheet. Um, and, and we did tell them that locations had to be on arterials or collectors, because as we've seen on multiple slides now, those are, those are the uh, two facility types where we see a, a large over-representation of pedestrian fatal and serious injury crashes. Eligible countermeasures through this program uh, included uh, some, some more intense infrastructure like, like curb ramps or uh, curb ramps, aren't that bad, but raised crosswalks, um, curb extensions, ref, refuge islands, all stuff that require um, like full uh, utility location survey, all that kind of stuff. Uh, some, some kind of medium cost countermeasures like signalization and then um, some some fairly fairly cheap uh, simple countermeasures like like high visibility crosswalks or advanced yield markings or some some standard signage RRFBs that kind of thing. So with the ten million dollars that we started the program with, um, and that's just including construction costs, uh, where we we move forward to design 455 individual locations across these eight cities. Uh, there are over 2,000 individual. Um, countermeasures or treatments that, that will be performed at these 455 locations uh, once, once construction is all said and done. 
Any questions? Spotlight Ray. No, nothing in the box. All right. Uh, we got another polling question up next. So what is the top fatal pedestrian crash type or the, the top location that uh, fatal pedestrian crashes occur? We're halfway there, 50%. All right. Overwhelming majority, so we'll go ahead and close this. Um, so 75% crossing mid-block, 16% walking along the roadway, um, none for secondary crash, and 9% uh, through vehicle at an intersection. All right. Yep, that, that top one was crossing mid-block, uh, walking along the roadway and through vehicle at intersection were, were the next two on the list. Um, they all make up a large portion of, of our fatal pedestrian crash types. So now that we've covered PSIP, I wanted to kind of broaden the scope a little bit. Um, that while this shocked and systemic analysis that we perform does include pedestrians, um, it, it is more of a, a citywide analysis of the, all of their transportation infrastructure, so no matter the user. Um, so in the Highway Safety Manual, this is a graphic that, that they, uh, they have that um, systemic analyses should be based off of. So you, you start off with just I identifying your, your major crash types and, and risk factors from those crash types. Um, then you screen a network and prioritize locations based off that screening. Uh, then you can select your countermeasures based off uh, your your risk factors usually will tell you what kind of countermeasures might might be useful for a city and then you prioritize projects from that list of countermeasures um, and then where our program comes into play although we we help with all that initial stuff uh, funding the actual project itself and then uh, performing an evaluation later on because um, uh, as We've been told, and as we've seen, uh, these these systemic projects really do uh, improve safety um, in in not a non marginal way. It's 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 usually a fairly large improvement that that uh, that, that we see um, that per per unit or per treatment itself, it goes it, it's it goes way above and beyond what what we would see on just a spot safety treatment. So. Uh, with this project itself, um, th these were the steps laid out in the systemic analysis technical report, very similar to the graphic seen before, just kind of um, brushed down a little bit. <clears throat> so in Kashokton, uh, we ran that 2009 to 2018 crash data, um, and you can see that the trends were, were up from 2009 to 2018 of total crashes. Uh, property damage only crashes and injury crashes. Um, and, and there were seven total fatal crashes in the city um, for for that 10 year period, um, which which wasn't a, egregious, I would say for a city of that size, but the total number of crashes and the injury crashes were, were higher than we would typically see for a city of Kishak size. Um, so from all this crash data, um, uh, working with the consultant, heat maps were developed um, so total crashes here in the top left, um, and you'll see that 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 kind of overlaps with injury crashes a little bit. Um, and and I've tried to pull some of the more unique graphics, like like fatal crashes, because they were more spot. They they weren't on some of these like very dense crash networks that that we see throughout the city. Um, non motorist crashes they didn't line up super super well besides this little spot um, with the total crashes. But red light running crashes seem to to fit the mold of total crashes fairly well, surprisingly. Um, so with with seeing this this overlap between total crashes and injury crashes, so so we can kind of kind of tackle all these things that are more in that yellow yellowy color. Um, so that that's where we, we came at after analyzing the crash data fixes for these um, speed related, which definitely can be fixed within um, probably drug or alcohol related or or something else. Um, so we, we didn't want to, uh, normally we would prior, prioritize fatal crashes a ton, but because we could knock out a few of these, we, we still wanted to prioritize them, but not 
not in a way we normally would on, on projects like this be, because not all of them were preventable by in infrastructure changes. So then looking at the injury crashes, um, do the same thing, uh, analyze these to determine possible infrastructure fixes, um, be a good indicator of major risk factors on, on a specific system. Uh, and then of all the injury crashes, we saw a rear end fixed object and pedestrian crashes kind of kind of stand out um, higher than the rest because they were they were overrepresented uh, like kind of on, on a statewide basis as well here. So so those were the ones that were kind of picked out to focus on with countermeasure and risk factor selection. So scoring each road segment in Coshocton uh, with, with this analysis, we had to come up with some risk factors to assign to all the different segments and intersections. So um, the, these these listed are, are some of the ones, I guess um, some ones kind of pick out um, whether or not signalized, the intersection was signalized was, was a huge uh, thing in Coshocton. Um, how many signals per approach lane? So, so technically, the national standard is to have two signals per through lane at an intersection. But some, some older uh, signal setups, like Shockton had, some of their signals were 50 plus years old. Uh, they only had one signal head for for a lane approaching. Um, just yeah, like the outdated signals. Um, it, it was interesting to see the maximum of approach speed posted at 25 was a risk factor, although secondary. So I guess secondary would mean like if we're scoring this based off risk, it'd be given half a point instead of a point, basically. Um, then uh, eastbound, westbound stop controlled approach, which kind of goes hand in hand with a, a intersection not being signalized, um, the side streets would be stop controlled. Uh, some of the segments, um, whether or not there was a two-way left turn lane was, was one of the risk factors that was looked at. Um, angled on-street parking, um, that, that's a big one because uh, we've seen that this around the state um, front, pull, if you pull in front to park at an angle, um, which, which is fairly common, uh, it's it's much more dangerous than, than back in angle parking or parallel parking. Um, so, so that was one of like the very simple countermeasures recommended that the city can actually pursue on their own whenever they have their next pavement marking maintenance job. They can just change the, their, their parking spaces from forward angle to backward angle parking. Um, so mid-block pedestrian crossings and, and the others listed were also risk factors in the city. Um, so going through all of those risk factors, uh, we were able to assign point values to every individual intersection and segment in the city and came up with this priority map on the left and, and the scores are there on the right. Um, so at the tail ends of, of each segment or corridor you will see it kind of turns into that green uh, low risk score section but um so so their primary more more urban corridors were were what scored pretty high and what what made it over onto the priority system for for this analysis um and and why these they they make up nine percent of the lane miles in the city but 65 percent of the total crashes and 68% of the injury crashes. So, so crashes and injury crashes are both overrepresented <clears throat> along this particular system. So then after we went through the risk factors, we had to go through countermeasure selection. Um, and basically each risk factor was assigned up to three separate types of countermeasures, whether that was short-term or low cost, that basically could be done now. Uh, medium to mid cost, like like some signal improvements that may take a little longer, but but aren't uh, super expensive, like full rebuilds, um, and the longer high cost uh, countermeasures, which in this case were typically full signal upgrades um, because of their deteriorating signal system in the city. Um, and just just continuing that that list. Um, it pretty pretty similar to to the list on on the page before. Most of it in the city involved, at least for stuff they needed funding assistance with, involved full signal rebuilds. Uh, so now um, I'm gonna just kind of pull up this website. This was another little pilot um, systemic network analysis that we did in the 
Miami Valley Regional Planning Commission area. Um, and so we, we in some of the Southern counties here, we, we have pretty good that kind of goes through some of these high risk segments and high risk intersections, similar to um, or where the counties and but um, manuals and, and different uh, different treatment and just some of the Oklahoma yeah that's that's PSIP. Um, yes, so I I'm not technically our our like head and bike chair, so I I don't deal firsthand with that a lot. But but we have pretty good relationships with um, especially some of the larger trail groups like Ohio to Erie, Erie trails or uh, Ohio Greenways. Um, and, and local bike advocacy groups are brought in when we are discussing things like the state and U.S. bike route system with, with individual districts and counties. All right, next question. Um, I do have a question that isn't related to today's session, but an earlier one. We have a few locations on our local roads that have very steep slopes that drop a substantial distance from the roadside. These areas do warrant guardrails based on their depth and steepness. The problem is, is we cannot achieve the offset of edge traveled, hold on, the offset of edge traveled way to face of rail, nor the height that the guardrail is supposed to be. Is there any guidance in these situations? Example, not installing warranted guardrails versus installing guardrail that doesn't meet standards and may not perform the way it should. And secondly, does the safety program consider funding guardrail installation along an entire roadway? Uh, to to the first part of that, um, that that would be more something for our roadway engineering group. So um, I, it sounds like that's something where guardrail still could be installed uh, without knowing the, the exact location and the the how how it looks and the topography. It's it's hard to say, but um, they frequently do give out design exceptions um, for cases just like that. Uh, so I would recommend working with the district safety review team um, in any respective district and then uh, get, getting them to uh, pr probably apply for an abbreviated project uh, where, where the design exception uh, is known ahead of time. Um, and, and yes, this, the safety program will fund that kind of stuff in a systemic fashion if, if there is a, if we can justify it for, for a safety reason, which high level sounds like that is something that could be justified in that that instance. Okay. Um oh, is the one hundred oh sorry, go ahead, it Ray. Was definitely one of, it was definitely one of our systemic improvements, guardrail. So mm -hmm. yeah, we've done it before. Okay, next question. Is the one hundred percent funding on safety projects continuing this September round? That's how we are moving forward right now. Um, it's so we, we we have the September round planned and and the application process is still open with the intent that projects will be funded at 100% uh, safety money. Um, I guess it's it's not totally up to our program. There there are people higher than us in the state that that make the budget and stuff. So if if we are told to do otherwise, then then we will. But for now, we're moving full steam ahead and assuming that we're gonna be continuing to fund projects at 100% until our total revenue credit uh, starts to dwindle. Okay, um, how can locals or MPOs initiate these types of projects? Um, you can definitely email me. Um, I'll pull up my, my contact slide and take it down. Um, also, we we did share the, the district um, I think in the, the first, first and second web list, it, it shows kind of the the point person to contact for safety projects in in your respective district. Um, and if you if you're not sure what district you might you might be in, uh, you can just reach out directly to me, and and I'll, I'll have to work through them anyways to to get a project together. So um, yeah, either either me or someone in in your district that's on their safety review team. How about whoever asked that question, tell us what agency you're with, please. Or that, if, if you don't know your district. Nothing yet, and uh, that was the last question in the box. 
you know, like we showed uh, examples in the first couple, the parts two and three, how like City of Newark worked with their, um, what do you call LCATs? They're part of a, what is, what's the bigger picture, what they are, Jeremy? Um, there's some sort of regional transportation planning organization. So RTPO, MPO, right. uh, I'm, not, I'm not sure exactly their classification. But. RTPO, that's what I was looking for. Okay. Okay, so if you're you know, if you're a city, you should work with your your MPO or RTPO, and you work together to contact the ODOT district office. That's usually a the standard way of getting something rolling. But you know, but if you don't know that, then it's you know you you know how to get a hold of me and Jeremy, and uh, we'll help you out that way. Um, so there's really no excuse to to not get a safety project going, it sounds like. You know, you gotta, but well, we gotta hear from you guys first. And um, you gotta get it while the getting's good. And uh, <laughs> if Jeremy's telling you that these are 100% funded, I mean, what exactly is holding you back, right? So, you know, our initiative is to reduce all kinds of crashes, not just motor vehicle, but also pedestrian and bicyclist. And, uh, you know, we're part of the towards zero deaths campaign. And that's why we're working hard to offer you this uh, free webinar series and a bunch of other webinars that we put together uh, during this time of the pandemic. And uh, we've got more webinars coming. And, um, you know, we're just, just hoping to, that this reaching out to all local governments will uh, uh, help us reduce the number of crashes, especially ones that have been rising uh, in the past few years, like pedestrian crashes or fatal vehicle crashes, things like that. So trying to to bring attention to these type of crashes so that we can lower them. So that is the main cause, the main reason behind why we're uh, having this webinar. Right, and to some of Ray's points there, um, that this this is an issue nationally too, um, with, with just overall. Uh, transportation fatalities and, and vulnerable user fatalities. So as right now, there's actually a bill that, that's in the House that's likely to get passed onto the Senate that, that'll increase, uh, increase uh, the, the funding of all of the state's highway safety improvement programs and <clears throat> allocate additional funding to bicycle and pedestrian infrastructure and just make our, our funding buckets more flexible overall so we can more frequently provide 100% funding because it's, it's not like we don't want to keep doing it. There, there are rules and regulations that we do have to have to follow that come from federal guidelines because um, we get a large chunk of our money from the federal government, at close to 80 million of, of the 159. So, um, that, that, that may be coming over the next couple of years. Um, in, in Ohio specifically, there, there is, I think it's Senate Bill 73, if I remember the number correctly, that will change the kind of the crosswalk law that as it's currently written um, right now, when a pedestrian steps into the, the curb ramp, getting ready to cross a road, it's, it's a yield condition for cars. And the, as the current bill will change that to a stop condition, when, when a pedestrian gets ready to cross the road at, at a crosswalk, um, which which is something other states have done, and it's been fairly effective because that that allows for additional uh, enforcement and and also just it, it's just something that that we can send the press releases and, and notify the the traveling public about that that this is now a stop condition and it's, it's much much safer for for those crossing the road. All right, thanks for that, Jeremy. We also have another question. Yeah. Um, it says, have, have, has ODOT ever funded the Rails to Trails projects? So I, I'm, I'm not positive on that one. Um, I believe our state and US bike route system does have some shared use paths that were created with with those with that project with or with that initiative um and i i know ohio's further along than a lot of states are with with rails to trails um but if 
I know if it's on a state and U.S. bike route system, which which I some some of our shared use paths from that initiative are, um, that our safety program will will fund upgrades or, or other other things to that. Like right now, up in District Three, I'm working on um, a trail crossings pro project on, on um, the North Coast Inland Trail to to get some enhanced crossings there. So our program will fund that kind of stuff. Okay, well, um, I see no other questions. I'll give a, I'll give five seconds for somebody to start typing. If someone starts typing, I'll know it. <laughs> All right, well, this is going to wrap up our four part series. So, uh, really appreciate everybody taking part in this and doing your part to, uh, to uh, lower crashes in Ohio of all kinds. And uh, we look forward to uh, seeing you at our next webinar. I know I've got some coming up. I've got some uh, work zone traffic control webinars coming up and also invented one that's uh, where I'm gonna talk all about our Ohio LTAP website, just to uh, get the word out there that uh, to show off all of the many resources we have for local governments on the Ohio LTAP website because uh, we get questions all the time that you know people just didn't know that they could have found that answer right away on our website and they sometimes have to wait for us to get back with them so uh, that kind of brought about uh, why we created this new uh, it's it's not a several series it's just a one hour webinar so uh, that'll be on August 5th so um, if to make sure that you hear about all the latest webinars, you can go to the Ohio LTAP website and click on the subscribe to mailing list uh, button at the bottom right of our homepage. And that way you'll be um, for sure to not miss out on all the latest stuff we have to offer. So I wanna thank uh, Jeremy Thompson for uh, sharing his expertise uh, these last four days and Dirk Gross from ODOT District 6 and of course Paula Hyman who has been our hostess with the mostest so um, thank you everybody and uh, I guess this is uh, sayonara we'll see you next time